Welcome to Book Time with Ryan. I am Ryan, and today I'll be talking about Chesapeake Requiem by Earl Swift. This is A Year with the Watermen of Vanishing Tangier Island. What I would recommend you do is search one thing in Google Maps, Tangier Island, and you'll find that it is a small island in the Chesapeake, just below where Maryland turns into Virginia. It's isolated, it's 16 miles off the coast. It's small, it's really kind of a, a group of three islands that were part of a peninsula that mostly has gone underwater over thousands of years. Its heartbeat is the waterman industry, which is crabbing and oystering. The other thing I would recommend you do is, I did this on YouTube, but look up Tangier, that's T-A-N-G-I-E-R, Tangier Island Accent because it is a very isolated group of people, 60 miles off the coast, so not extremely isolated, but especially when you look at how populated the East Coast is in the United States, it's it's pretty isolated. It's been isolated for a long time. I mean, people go back and forth from it. There, there are tourists and stuff. It's not like it's an undiscovered island, but it's a fairly closed island. When I read this book, Diane got this for me. My wife got it for me, I think for my birthday. And it was just because it's about the Chesapeake and on the front of it, there's actually a waterman. And then there's, this is a blue crab. So when I read this book, I kind of thought of it in three different parts, mixed in, it goes back and forth, but I, I think of it as a story of a small town. I thought of it as a story of an ecological disaster and a story of watermen. And it was the waterman aspect that got me pretty excited because we were going to my parents this past weekend and they live on the Eastern shore of Maryland, which is also a place steeped in waterman tradition. And I reached out, well, I reached out to my mom. I, I talked to my parents all the time. I reached out to my mom and I was like, Hey, I'm reading this book. Do you know of anybody in the area that I could talk to or, or see their boats or go out or whatever? And she said, let me check. So I'm going to get to this at the end of this video. But I had a great time with a waterman named Cody and spending some time with Cody and his brother Aaron and his dad Dwayne and learning about Cody's work. His boat is called the Capital Gains. It has a really cool logo. It's like $100 bills. He has an accounting degree. Cody, if you ever get a second boat, I would also say another good accounting name would be Going Concern. I don't know if that tests fate. But I think that would be a good accounting name for a boat. So Cody showed me his boat, how it was rigged up right now for oysters. We were going to go out, but it was too too windy the day that, that we were looking at it. So he took me around and showed me pots and showed me his boat and crabs. And he and his dad and his brother talked to me about crabs, how to identify them. And so I'll have a lot of that video at the end. It's, it's cool. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you, Cody and Cody's family for you know, spending time on a Saturday. So Chesapeake Requiem, what is this about? This is about a small island in the middle of the Chesapeake that is disappearing. It is disappearing for a few reasons. One is erosion. The salt water moves in on the island, claims more and more of the island. The trees that are on the island cannot survive the salt water, so they die off when they die. The island loses a lot of that kind of the root structure that holds the island together. And this is, a, this is an island that's pretty, pretty far out in the middle of Chesapeake. So it's really exposed to winds and water movement and ice movement that chips away at the island. Chips away at the island a lot. We're talking 40 to 70 feet of coastline is lost a year. That's crazy. It's also losing land because it's sinking. It's sinking or the area around it is raising up. Some of that may be global warming induced, some of it, and that can be human or otherwise, because we are leaving, and we've been doing this for a while, leaving a ice age. What I was not aware of is there's this other concept that explains why the island is sinking. So not only are they losing coastline, but areas are kind of lower and lower. We're talking millimeters a year, but it adds up. 
over millennia. This is called glacial isostatic adjustment. I have a visual aid. This is my daughter's ball. She wrote on it recently. I don't know why she did that. All right, so if this is the Earth, if this is not, but like Ice Age, miles of ice stacked up, especially at the poles. A lot of weight on the crust and the mantle of Earth. Right? Usually this would be rounder, but it's a squishy ball. So this weight that's on the poles pushes down on the Earth's mantle and it starts to bow out. This is going to be an extreme example, but look at that. This is what would happen, right? It's it's squishing out and you can see the sides going out further. So the glaciers are pushing down on the mantle, which is bowing out kind of the middle areas. And, and, and this is also bowing out kind of continents. So if this is on much of North America, it's squishing out the lower parts of North America. This is kind of the, the, a rough estimate of what it would look like with glaciers. Now, glaciers started to melt thousands and thousands of years ago. And it starts to do this. The, the pressure, the, the weight on the poles is lessened and that allows the, the mantle and the crust to go back into its normal shape. That's kind of sucking in. From our view in the Chesapeake, it's sinking back down. So that glacial isostatic adjustment is small, it's constant, and it will be continuing for thousands of years. That's part of what's at work here. But a huge part of it is the erosion. The erosion is from a lot of open water, and just the constant beating of the coastline with waves. And uh, in the winter, when ice forms, ice is something that you cannot get out of the way of. And it, tear stuff up. What happens is you lose coastline. The coastline turns into marsh. The marsh turns into sand and the marsh is eaten away and the sand is eaten away. The marsh doesn't turn to sand but the marsh is really vulnerable and you lose more and more and this starts speeding up because as you lose more coastline you have more parts of the islands that are exposed. There's a, a couple of little maps in this book, but it shows what the coastline, which is gray here, looked like in 1850 and what it looks like now. And you can just see how much has been lost of the three islands. And this is an example. This shows you where in the Chesapeake this island is. This is a, a major problem because there are three kind of distinct communities that remain on this island and they're all at risk to going on the water or one bad hurricane wiping them out. There were other communities. There's a community called Canaan on the uppers, which is the upper island, and that's already disappeared. That's hundreds of, of feet off the coast now where it used to be land. You also have the story of a small town. This is an area where it was settled in the 16 and 17 hundreds as kind of like a area of few families settled for farmland and grazing. And then they discovered more and more of the opportunities with oysters first and then crabs later. Part of the reason that it took a little bit of time for those two industries to really kick off was this is the Eastern Shore, it's pretty isolated at this point. And there was really, it was it was difficult to get what was caught to a marketplace where there was demand. Think about New York City. Until there was refrigeration and there was an Eastern Shore Railroad that could move the product up the coast. Uh, it was more subsistence and local, local market. When this area was settled, it was just a couple families. Today, I think it's like 45% of the population in Tangier Island has three names. They're not all related because there is this concern that there must be, a, there must have been inbreeding. But when I say they're related, we're talking like five, six, seven, eight generations back. So it's great, 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 great grandfather they have in common. That's pretty, 
pretty decent separation there. There's also been a lot of people who have come to the island and that also obviously allows for more genetic variation. But it's a small town. It was bigger. It was up to something like 12 or 1400 people. Now I think in this book, which was published in 2018, there are something like 400 people left or 470 or something like that. It's getting smaller and smaller. There's not as much holding people there. It's not an investment. People aren't coming to Tangier Island to make a home because they understand that the island is vanishing. And there have been many attempts to have the government step in and protect the island. Had either riprap or breaks around the island to stop the erosion, stop the forces of the bay acting on the island, but it hasn't gone anywhere yet, at least as far as I know. Just get a feel that it's a small town set in its ways, and that's good and that's bad. It's good because it does help people support each other and watch out for each other and really at times risk their lives. And there are people in this book that die um, it's, it's a dangerous lifestyle, fishing, and watermen run a lot of risks. But there are also many examples in this book of people putting themselves out there, risking their lives to help their fellow watermen, which is pretty amazing. Earl was there for over a year and really got a kind of a feel for the community and what's going on. There was a lot of faith in the community. It, it, there's two churches, which split off of one. They're Methodist. Most, a lot of them are Methodist. I'm Methodist. I found that a lot of the Eastern Shore is Methodist and it was probably through, I don't know if they're called circuit riders then, but a heavy, very conservative Methodist population and a spinoff that's probably even more conservative of that church called the New Testament Church. And that was a, a huge ordeal when it happened something like 70 years ago, 60 years ago. So you have that small town. If you've lived in a small town, you know it. Everyone knows everyone's business. You can either get on the right side or the wrong side of people. People know generations of their businesses. It can be rough and it can be good. They've also experienced what a lot of small towns are experiencing, drug abuse. The other thing that this, this book goes into is the culture of Waterman. My parents live on the Eastern Shore. This book early on, page 34, mentions a business called Lindy's, which is a kind of a, I think a processing distribution company for seafood. And the owner of Lindy's lives in my parents' neighborhood. And the town that they're in, Wolford, is mentioned in this book, which is crazy because it's a small, small town. It's outside of Cambridge, Maryland. But just to even see that there was like, what, what is this? So I got to the Eastern Shore and I really wanted to see what this was all about. Now there are differences between what's going on in Tangier and what's going on on some parts of the Eastern Shore. Tangier is exposed. So they have boats that are called dead drops. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like and what it is. Explain kind of what it, what it means. This is an example of a dead drop. The sides drop off really quickly. It, it's good for pushing through waves, cutting through waves, but it also means that it has more of a draft. So it can't go in pretty shallow areas. That's a limiting thing. Not an issue for Tangier where it's a little bit deeper off of the island. On the eastern shore, there's more lee and there's more shelter from the elements. So the the boats are a little bit smaller. They don't have as much draft because they're not going out in as deep waters with the kind of open bay weather that they can experience. I mean, they could, but they just would be more vulnerable to that. In the summer period, spring and fall, they're they're crabbing. For blue crabs, blue crabs are crabbed along the east coast, but there are different areas that taste different. I'm told, and I've read, that Chesapeake Bay blue crabs are the best because they do have a period where the crabs hibernate. They burrow in, they dig into the bottom, and they sleep over, over the winter. And when they do that, they have to get fat stores. So blue crabs in the Chesapeake, because of the, the changes in the weather, are sweeter and fattier because when you go further south, they don't do that. So they're just kind of always using their meat instead of building it up. You have different size crabs and different size limits. Uh, Cody 
He has licenses for Maryland and Virginia. Historically, long ago, there were wars called the Oyster Wars between Virginia and Maryland, uh, between oystermen who were fighting over their kind of their territories. That doesn't happen anymore. They don't shoot it out anymore. He's able to work in both, but there are different size limits and there are a number of different restrictions between Virginia and Maryland. There are two kinds of crabs. There are male crabs, female crabs. Male crabs are jimmies or he crabs. I think this is one of those kind of nuanced things. My understanding was jimmies are the larger crabs, the larger male crabs. And if it's not like a jumbo crab, it's probably called a he crab, a male crab. And then there are female crabs called sooks. I have video, which I'll show, of Cody and Aaron and Dwayne explaining the crabs and how to tell the difference between a male and a female. And if the female's already had a sponge or a group of eggs or she hasn't, they'll, they'll shed once. And once they shed, they're done. Males will continue to shed throughout their lives. So some people think that the males are better tasting because they continue to get bigger and bigger and they shed and they're not as hard because females, once they've shed, they're going to get hard and they're going to get harder and harder throughout their lives. And it only happens once. So you're going to spend more time trying to crack through the shell. With, with male crabs, you have more opportunities for them to shed. We'll also see in that video peelers. Peelers are crabs that are about to shed. They have exoskeletons, so they have to crack out of the skeleton and come out. When they're when they come out, they're very vulnerable. They double in size and their heart their their new shells harden. But during that period, they're very vulnerable, so they're inactive. They try to hide. See right they see that little pink dot right there where I got my, my finger at. Yeah. It's a little line right there. That's pink. That's how you tell if it's a peel. So this one hasn't peeled yet. It hasn't peeled yet, no, but if she's ready to. See her? She's cracked underneath here. Oh, yeah. She's ready to shed. How big is it? This is small, right? Is it's, this small? It's, it's, it's about, legal. it's legal. It's about three inches, three and a quarter inches. What's, what is, uh, three and a quarter? Yeah, it it talks about like jumbo and they get, yeah. that's the size of the That's the size when they, when they So that's out. a male? This is a male. Male is female. And see how this one's actually got a soft claw. And that one's had eggs before because no, 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 no. 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 It turns ready. into a rounded thing when, yeah, it when she backs out. Yep. See this one's actually got a soft claw. That's where he lost his claw and he's growing a new one. So when he sheds he'll have a a claw that comes out and he'll regenerate another one. That's yeah. how he'll get a new And claw. he'll be double that size. Yeah. Same thing with this one. It turns into they that. double in size when they yeah yeah that one will turn into that oh that one's had it okay and That's they only female. do that once yeah once uh, they get that they don't shed once a male will keep shed shedding until he dies yeah what crabbers will do is if they find crabs that look like they're about to peel peelers um, they'll gather those and they have to monitor them every four hours because once they lose their shell they need to be separated if other crabs have just shed their shells because crabs are cannibalistic and they will eat their own so the hard crabs will go after the soft shell crabs soft shell crabs because they know they're vulnerable will not go after each other i've never had soft shell crab until this weekend and i did aaron gave me seven soft shell crabs then we were invited over for a birthday party and cody cooked them up i'll show you the video of of that process and me eating it I actually ate one before I videotaped it and I liked it and I realized I didn't I didn't record it so I went back and did it again not did it again did another crab and the second time I, I also later put it on bread and I really liked it on bread but when it's soft shell you eat the whole thing legs everything I mean they cut off the head they remove the gills all that was already done with the crabs that I had it's amazing just to experience all this and to be able to spend the time with Cody and to meet his family and to talk about the Waterman lifestyle. Cody is fifth generation Waterman. And when you think about all of the knowledge that is passed down through that process, it, it's crazy. I mean, I read this, when you read a book, I think it, it makes the subject matter feel kind of foreign 
and really special and in some ways fake because you, unless it's an area that you're it's an industry that you're in or an area that you work in it just kind of has like the star power so it was cool to go from that reading this book to go and meet people who all the information in this book was like common knowledge and second nature and there's so much contained in that community about crabbing the crabs the environment the weather what has happened with the industry over the years it, it's just it was really cool to see and it's a fairly closed community not closed like they don't want to talk to people but closed because there's only a certain number of licenses and like cody's license he bought off of his grandfather so he has the same number of pots as his grandfather had and that's you have to find somebody that's trying to sell their license and buy it and it's not cheap or work for somebody that has a license and it's pretty amazing stuff i'll show you kind of the the process of cooking the, the soft shell crab we use i forgot what it's called Aut autry something autry like breading for seafood and then something else mixed in which I, i'm blanking on it's not old bay this is like for the locals i feel like old bay is more for everyone else that's outside of the industry but it's something that's better than old bay but i can't remember what it is and it was it was really good and it was just cool to eat it there and experience that and i liked it and i i could have more i think i liked it better on a sandwich i think i also probably ate the second one after it cooled down a little bit so it was a little more crunchy <music> It was cool and it was really neat to hang out with Cody and just see what he does. He showed me his boat was rigged up for oystering and it has this kind of like claw thing that's really rusted. And it's funny because in the book, Earl Swift talks about seeing a boat rigged and how rusted and old these things look. They were all the same. They all look the same way. And I thought, I was like, man, that thing must be old. And then I saw Earl commenting about how old the ones looked like he was using but they're just you know they're exposed to salt water and the further up you go it's brackish in our the area where my parents live but um there's some exposure to kind of salt water so you would put so when i'm crabbing i would stand here like right here i have an arm that comes out here and crabs them i would fish pods you would pull you would hook the buoy throw it in here and I would use this this is another hydraulics that comes up and then I have like another table sitting here that's right okay that's where the he's separating uh, shaking pots yep so they don't go and I throw it up here then I'm going to the next one while he's doing all that and, and uh that's basically it for craving also pots Cody makes his own pots so he showed me his pots that were at his grandfather's house and we talked about that a little bit. He makes a lot of them. He sells them to people. He also has to replace his own pots that, you know, are, are either fouled or eventually go through electrolysis. And I mean, they have zinc pieces that reduce that, but eventually eat away at the kind of the net the cage to it. That's what I do in the wintertime. Is like chicken wire? Yeah, it's like, it's like hex wire. It's, um, it's made just for salt water, but it's, uh, I make them. There's a bunch of different ways you can make them. These are all yours? Yeah, and then I got some more over the docks so. How long does it take to like set them? 
I can usually, I can probably set, I can probably set three or four hundred a day. If you, you know, I, I take about a hundred, hundred fifty five on a load of on my boat. So I really recommend this book. I mean, this is talking about a very small, tight knit island, Tangier Island, that is disappearing, and it really goes into the culture that we're going to lose out on, and the history that we would lose. But it also goes into a very current, very real industry, the waterman industry, and experiences of small town living and what that looks like and the, the pros and the cons of that for that community and, and I think communities in general. Tangier Island is not too far away from where I live. I mean, it's not, we can't see it, it's not that close, but it's much closer than I thought. And it's still difficult to get to, but it was, it's an amazing story, and I do hope after reading this that they figure out some way of saving not only the environment, which is sometimes more of a concern, but also that town, because I do think it has a very unique culture that is, goes well beyond the accents. And look up the accent, because it is very different. Even in America, I mean, it's something that really, really stand out. I've never heard it anywhere else. So, five stars. Really exciting to read this and thanks so much to my wife for buying it for me and i i think it was just because it was about the chesapeake but it was such a good book and it's it's fairly long i think it's 400 something pages really interesting stuff probably a part of america that you're unaware of because i was aware of many aspects of this book but even with that awareness and, and some of that close proximity where my parents live it still was a, a refreshing read and it was really exciting for me to be able to go and experience some of this too with Cody. So check it out. Chesapeake Requiem by Earl Swift. And Cody, thank you again for having me for the morning. I felt like it was a very early morning. It was seven, I woke up at 6.30 on a Saturday. It felt painful. And then I found out that Cody usually wakes up at 3, 3.30, which sounds horrible. But he did that seven o'clock on a Saturday for me and took me around for hours and showed me so much stuff and it really helped my appreciation for Waterman and also for this book and just kind of brought home what I've been reading about for the week. Check it out. Look up where Tangier Island is. Look up the accent of Tangier Island and, and get into it. You'll see from the, the Google shots that there is a lot of kind of incursion of water into this island system and there's probably not a lot of time left for it so it's going to require action from the state from the federal government probably that's pretty critical for that community thanks for being here today check it out go have a soft shell crab and think of me when you do it i don't know why you don't have to think of me when you do it just go have a soft shell crab if you haven't done it you can eat the whole thing pretty cool that's it here. Thanks. Bye.